We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and it's uh, it's been a minute, but we are back, uh, and yeah. we're going to Japan in April. I'm still not okay with it. It's still weird. Like, I understand the regionalization and, you know, different races for weather, whatever, but Suzuka's not an April race. <laughs> Let me just say no. it. No. <laughs> no. And I mean, I have this, you know, later down in the rundown, but we might as well just knock it out now because it is just so weird. But I like the biggest thing about Suzuka is Suzuka was in September, October, and they wanted to be in September, October because that's when the champions get crowned. So I want to know what I really want to know what it took for F1 to convince the Japanese Grand Prix organizers to like, to be okay with the move to, to, to March. Wow. What month is it? April. Um, and you know how they could be okay with losing the prestige of like champions were used to be crowned at Suzuka. Champions won't be crowned at Suzuka anymore in April. I mean, I feel like there has to be a caveat in the contract of scheduling. Sure. Whatever is best for, you know, F1. I don't know. But yeah, it, I'm sure it was like a blow because now where is it going to be crowned? I mean, I know it's not Suzuka, but now I can't even keep the yeah. schedule straight because who knows when anything is anymore. Yeah, I guess it's, what, it's weird. It might be Coda. Coda's the new because Coda's pushed. I think it might be Coda. Yeah. Ooh. That could, that could be an interesting weekend um but yeah it's just and it, it's like because you know like yes environmentalism is important but environmentalism is 100 not in the forefront of like these massive event organizers as much as they say it is like let's be real here like they're like oh it's better for the planet that if, if formula one takes fewer flights from australia to japan to china um so yes we will happily move to april instead of our prestigious slot in september october well, I also think it's just easier on the drivers and the teams as well. Like having to get everything across the world multiple times alone oh, yeah. is a feat. But having to like make trips that don't make sense, that's just a lot. And like they're already on that side of the world. Let them stay there. Let them Oh, I know, agree. Marinate like we, in that time zone. <laughs> yeah, we, we know that it's hard enough on Williams right now because Williams had to take um, Alex Albon's car chassis, send it back to Grove, and then get that thing shipped over to Suzuka, Suzuka after they repaired it, which from what we've heard, everything looks repaired and ready to go, but they still only have the the two buckets like they don't have a backup bucket still yeah james came out and said we will have two chassis we will not have three <laughs> so no one can crash <laughs> going no into... one's allowed to crash i wonder and if it happens again it, what would happen that would like be honestly what do you think they would do if you know alex crashes do they take logan out of the car again or what i think what so do you think I, I think really? they might. I think they might. Yeah. I, I don't think this is like a, a situation of like Albon needs to stop crashing. Like we're worried about Albon crashing. And I don't, I don't think that Albon will. Um, but it's, I, I think that Lo, Lo, Logan is the one to, to get screwed more over than Alex would, even if Alex is the one who crashed again. Well, yeah. Cause if Logan crashes, they're not giving him Alex's car. So if Logan crashes, awesome. he's out. If Alex crashes, Logan's out. Logan's out. <laughs> either way you throw it logan's not racing if something happens poor guy yeah and like suzuka is also a track that is you know pretty dnf heavy like this this is Especially not a track when you have weather weather too yeah i mean 2022 was a torrential downpour disaster of a race um last year we had a number of dnfs including a double dnf um from emily's favorite driver sergio perez so it'll it'll be really interesting to see what it's like especially with chances of rain in on you know for for sunday things are not looking sunshine and rainbows for chago no, I, I, I think a girl can point. dream for a double Checo's, double DNF. <laughs> Checo's gonna want some redemption out of this one. I mean, he's also gonna want redemption in his home race, but we have a few months to go before we get to Mexico. Uh, and before we really dive into Japan, we got to talk about some news of the week, which we fortunately do have to get into our news of the week. Yes. News of the we week was 
pretty quiet. There's one thing from a couple weeks ago that we didn't have a chance to talk about after Australia. Um, but for it, it has been a relatively quiet couple of weeks. The drivers have been off, you know, doing things, you know, mini vacations. Oh my gosh. Um, everyone's you know, been on Australia vacation. And yeah. Max and Max and his family were skiing somewhere and he was like, wait, did they go back to Europe to ski? And then I was like, oh, you can ski in Japan. Duh. Yeah. Um, everyone's but- in like, us. do you see Oscar and his girlfriend stay like standing awkwardly in Australia? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And yeah, we're, um, I'm trying to think where else people have been, but everyone's just everywhere. And they're all just having a nice week off, which good for yeah. them. Good for them. Yeah. Stress- it's, I mean, it's the, the, the F1 calendar is, is hard enough. And I think that there are a lot of these built in like week weeks off, like we're going to have a cu- couple double headers and triple headers, but we do have like, you know, this is a period where I, it's every two weeks we're getting a race, which is really good for the drivers, especially, you know, once we get, you know, into the slog of like the real long portions of the season. Yeah. Before we get into anything, I just want to say this and ask what you were thinking. When I saw Max skiing, I'm like, I feel like there are better vacation opportunities in the middle of F1 season than skiing. Maybe he's a really good skier, but that just seems like not a safe activity to be doing mid-season. Maybe that was just me, but... I mean, hopefully he kept off the double black diamond slopes or, or what I'm, I'm not a skier. I, I don't do, do those types of things. You, you're right. I was very confused when I saw those pictures, but like some people I mean, are on these, the beach. These... I get that. Why are you going skiing? Whatever. He's uh, they're adrenaline happen. junkies. They're like, that's, you know, they're, they're just adrenaline junkies. That's yeah. That's all. I know. That's the only answer I have. I know. That. It just, it was like. At, at, at this, like the first glance, I was like, "Wait, what? Is he actually skiing?" Yeah, he was. He was. Maybe, but... maybe his partner and her daughter were doing more of the skiing than he was. I don't know. We'll we'll see. I know because I saw it on her Instagram, and I was like, "Oh, this is really cool, like fun." And I was like, "Oh wait, Max is also Max there. is there what too. Is what are you doing?" Uh, anyways, let's jump back to the news of the week. That I just had thoughts yeah. on that. I was like, what are you doing? Go to a beach. Go somewhere. Stay in Australia. I don't get it. No, but they went to the cold. <laughs> <sighs> Whatever. Um, okay. So, like you were saying before I so rudely interrupted with my Max yeah. vacation spiel. Um, going back a few weeks ago, Susie Wolf, it was announced that she's taking legal action um, against the FIA in French court. Following the the conflict of interest um, investigation, everything between her and Toto. So one thing I want to bring up, and I know you do too, is that every single article referred to her as F1 boss's wife. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like mind blown at how they could do this because... I mean, obviously, if you're listening to this podcast and you've listened to ones before, Catherine and I think very, very highly of Susie Wolf. She's not some rando. She's not just an F1 boss's wife. She runs the F1 Academy. She's been in F1 for a very long time, extremely involved, extremely successful in her own right. I just don't understand how someone can sit there and just write, ah, yes, Susie Wolf, F1 boss's wife. F1 boss's wife. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely one of those, like, seriously it's 2024 you know women are not just you know as you know related to who their husbands are type of things um it's it's very lazy writing from the people who who did craft those headlines and you know it's it's one of those things where the traditional excuse and i i know this from my journalism background is you want to provide the the reader with enough context as quickly as possible to who this person is. So, you know, Toto Wolf is a huge name in Formula One and motorsport. Susie Wolf is his wife. Um, so that's the really lazy route when obviously the 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 headlines have been corrected at this point, because I was looking at this earlier, to now managing director of the F1 Academy is, you know, filing suit against the FAA. Okay. I'm not saying it's a good excuse. I'm just saying no, that that's the but reasoning. also you could with all the Christian Horner stuff, who's the more identifiable person in that relationship? It's going to be Ginger Spice. So it, you don't see them saying like Ginger Spice's husband cuz in that relationship worldwide, if you t- think about it, she's the more recognizable name than he is. Right. Yeah. 
There's the definitely a lot of sexism involved, a lot of journalistic laziness involved, um, a lot of this is what happens when you fire copy editors involved, because that's been another, you know, problem with journalism of the, over the last couple of decades. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge problem. And this is, you know, this isn't a raw feminist issue. This is a, she is a legitimate major sports figure right. in, you know, F, in the FIA, in Formula One, in motorsport. And this also does tie into, you know, some of the suppositions that have been made about the inquiry slash farce between her and Toto Wolf was that this was either, you know, an attempt on an, on an attack on someone in motorsport or an attempt to discredit her in motorsport, which all goes back to these issues of, you know, sexism and trying to push out, you know, efforts of, of women to, you know, grow within motorsport. Cause obviously motorsport worldwide is heavily male dominated. And Susie is working really hard with the F1 Academy with discover your drive to bring more women and to bring more gender equity into motorsport. So it's, it all ties together with a, you know, marked risk, lack of respect for women that, you know, nobody's, you know, not enough people will learn a lesson from this situation. They're like, oh, it was a botched headline, but it should be something. And the fact that Susie Wolf is, you know, continuing to make a stand on this when the FIA is happy to be like, oh, well, we investigated and there was nothing of it. So bye. It's, it's good that she's continuing to make a stand. There is a rule within the, you know, FIA governing body documents, whatever, that does allow for criminal complaints like the one that Susie has filed in French court, the FIA is based in France, um, about complaints made in bad faith. So clearly she's trying to get a push to, you know, get more clarity on what this complaint was less and probably not as much who, you know, who made it because there is an expectation of privacy with whistleblower complaints, but, you know, more clarity on what this investigation was because there was very little clarity when it was all being announced. Right. This whole thing just bothers me. And yeah. I, we've talked about it at, at length, but I just think it's ridiculous. Yeah. And I, I will also add that, you know, one of my favorite moments of all of this is like when it came out that, you know, allegedly team principals were saying that they had an issue with, you know, Susie and Toto. And then every single team and team principal came out the same, you know, within 30 minutes of one another and said, y'all, we didn't say shit. Yeah. That was one of my favorite like moments of Formula One coming together that I just thought was like it doesn't happen very often I just thought that was great well and I think it just goes to show how much respect everyone has for Susie of and what course. she's doing um do some of the moves with the F1 Academy is it probably helpful that her husband is Toto Wolf maybe but she's still an incredible figure in the F1 world that you know, she got teams to back drivers and she got them to be more involved. Like none of that happens without her. So right. to just say yeah. that she's, you know, someone's wife. Yeah, it's it's not. A, you don't get the Charlotte Tilbury sponsorship, which is a massive sponsorship without Susie Wolf and, you know, without a or Tommy at the head of or Tommy Hilfiger and, and Puma, both of which are leaving Mercedes after the season as, yeah. you know, major sponsors, which I think is, is really interesting. And I also think, you know, we could see a Tommy Hilfiger Ferrari uh, partnership coming up. See, I, do I don't think, think so, though, the... because Ferrari makes clothing and that so does Tommy Hilfiger. So I think that's a little conflict of interest from what I know about uh sponsorships but yeah um I think there might be too much of a conflict there but you never know there might they be could be a, there might be, they a, could be a driver sponsor to exactly Lewis so yeah yeah I do, I do think that their parting ways with Mercedes is a partly because Mercedes has been struggling and b because Lewis is leaving and not that that's a bad thing it's oh. you know Mercedes will find other new sponsors exactly look at Monster but I think it's really telling how, like, Monster left for McLaren and Tommy Hilfiger is leaving and so is Puma. But, again, Mercedes is struggling. They're losing their number one driver, which is probably why they went there in the first place. But do all of these make sense? The Tommy Hilfiger one 100% makes sense with Mercedes. But Puma, I don't know. Maybe not. So maybe they'll have someone else, you know. Oh, the, but there, there uh, are Adidas is definitely – I believe so. But, and there are definitely like major brands are clamoring to get involved with Formula One anywhere they can. So yeah. that those, those voids will be snatched up as within seconds. Yeah. 
No, for sure. It's so interesting, the landscape of sponsorships and mm-hmm. F1 cars or and F1 teams. Um, we should look into that to see, have do like an F101 on um, sponsorships. Oh, that could be a fun one. So moving on to other news this week, uh, McLaren, <laughs> they're, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, David. David Sanchez. Sanchez. Yeah. Yes. Uh, was hired from Ferrari in 20. 20- 23 started in 2024 and he's already out yeah this was really like so when andrea stella took over as team principal um he made a lot of changes in the organizational hierarchy at mclaren um and kind of like like put everything under like three umbrellas and it's like everyone was kind of like oh that's kind of weird um and one of the their big moves was hiring david sanchez from ferrari um apparently he missed like they they realized that there was a misalignment in quotes between the team's original expectations and what sanchez allegedly brought to the table um so they decided to part ways with him which i think is a really interesting move after three months. The The statement claims that it was a mutual decision so that Sanchez could pursue other opportunities in motorsport, but like, yikes. I guarantee you in six months, he isn't pursuing other opportunities in motorsport. Yeah. I don't know. Or maybe he gets he snatched up somewhere else really quick. But it just, yeah, it, this, I don't know. This seems weird. Yeah. It just, it seems like there's a lot of, you know, a merry-go-round of change within the upper echelons of McLaren. Like, you know, they, they had to redo the organizational hierarchy again and move things around with like their top three, top four guys, including the team principal Stella. Um, so this, this may not be anything to worry about, or this could be a worrying sign for McLaren, especially since McLaren is kind of, you know, beating out some, some expectations of where, where they were going to be this early on in the season. So we'll see. I know the, the, all of the technical hires and moves always just to me, it's a lot, especially how quickly they're hired and fired again or let go or Mm -hmm. mutually separate because if he started at the beginning of the year, he hasn't really had a hand in doing anything this year. Right. And like, maybe he has a hand in doing things for next season, but it just seems odd after doing nothing to just let him go. And, and I understand they did this whole like reevaluation, whatever, but if he was a good hire, then why get rid of him? I just don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Especially since he, you know, he was hired in, you know, February of 2023 and then went on garden leave, which I think is a very, British thing where if you you are leaving one position to another you basically have a period of time where you're not allowed to work or you don't work um so and I guess you hang out in your garden is I think the way where the term comes from I I I remember googling googling it like months ago um but I I just I I don't know what this means for McLaren but it's it's a little bit of a red flag yeah who knows what Zach's doing at McLaren honestly but We'll see. Speaking of McLaren, they do have a new livery this weekend. They have a special livery for Suzuka. I personally don't love it, but it's not as bad as their special livery from last year. So that's where I'm landing on this one. Yeah, it's my my problem with it is I feel like they didn't go all in on it. And this this right. livery is is um it is inspired by this a certain form of traditional Japanese calligraphy. I love Japanese calligraphy. um, But when I look at some of the static pictures of the car that are from far further back, which is, you know, more of what we're going to be seeing on screen on TV this weekend, it really just looked like they took the livery that they already had and slapped on some vinyls in the space that was left over from that initial livery instead of actually coming up with a full on livery for the whole car. Um, So I, I really feel like like they didn't go all in on this livery, which had an oppor- every opportunity to be really cool. And the bits if that you they did that close up are awesome. Yeah, those like right on the side, you can really see it. If they would have taken that and put it all over the entire car, it mm-hmm. would have been so cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's just not 
my favorite. But again, it's better than like the three different car liveries mashed into one special livery that they did last year. That that totally wasn't just a cigarette. Right. It was not not good. So because do I think this one is amazing? No. Do I think it's better than the, their last year's? Yes. So that's where I'm landing yeah. on it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very meh on it. It's it it hasn't wowed me yet. Um so we'll maybe we'll it'll see look better to you going at 200 kilometers per hour <laughs> oh okay and circling back to our favorite couple of f1 toto wolf will be in japan this weekend so we've talked about it a little bit he is you know trying to limit his schedule and take a little bit of a step back from his in the in-person um appearances and the presence at the races um he was not originally supposed to be in japan considering the team's current performance He's now going to be in Japan. Um, but yeah, we'll I don't know. I, I honestly don't know how much of a difference it makes if Toto's there or not. Yeah, I mean, as a, a leadership presence in a time of challenge, I can understand why he made the the decision to be like, mm, you know, I, I am going to, to be in Japan. You know, he's not the only person involved in, you know, motorsport who is trying to, you know, step back from having to be at all 24 races at, you know, Every single one, you know, David Croft, who's on Sky Sports, he's taking three races off this year because he's on, been on the broadcast forever. Martin Brundle doesn't go to every race um, every year anymore because he's, you know, had some health issues. So he's trying to, you know, take it easy. So it it's not that much of a surprise. I mean, there, there are probably other, you know, less high profile team principals on the grid who also aren't at every race. We just don't know it. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where I, I can understand why he decided to change up his schedule to, you know, make the appearance here because of what's going on with the team right now. Oh, for sure. And like, if he's adding this race, taking another one away or keeping the others, like it's still a step back. Cause he still is, you know, not going to every single one. So yeah, exactly. I just I love seeing him, you know, in the, garage, in the garage with this really tight um headset on where it looks like he's wearing a, you know, Blair Waldorf headband and all of his hair <laughs> sticking up. Love it. So good. Yeah. It's my favorite. So a and little bit more scowl, but sorry. Yeah, just... he he just it's it's fun to see him back there. It also Hopefully it means that we won't have a Bradley Lord weekend because as much as we respect what he does um, for the team when he's on the Sky broadcast, it's it's a little bit much for us. Um, yeah. And he, he's just he's a little bit dry. Um, so I hope we have James again. I know we just had James, but I hope we have him again just to talk about, you know, Williams. Yeah, I I, th- I think that Williams wouldn't want them to to be the the probably team not. that's picked, but uh, that it's would probably be, a you know, Fred Mister weekend. This is another thing that we should be we should be picking. Like <laughs> what weekend? <laughs> which will it team? Be? Which team? <laughs> it it might be a Fred weekend, honestly, just with Carlos winning. It could be. It, I think it'll be either Fred or Christian Horner. We haven't had Christian Horner oh, we haven't had in, Christian in a minute or or yet at all. I'm not sure. Obviously, last race was um, Laurent Mekis, the new team principal at RB. Um, so maybe it won't be Christian Horner for that because it was, you know, sticking. They wouldn't want to stick with the Red Bull family. I don't know. Um, but we we shall see um and we will also see some special helmets on the grid this weekend yes, we've seen it's, it's wednesday as we record we've seen two so far and i think you and i both have some thoughts on these yeah so yuki and lando both dropped specialty helmets as of this recording on wednesday um for suzuka yuki's is his home race helmet he always does a special one for japan um, normally I like them. I don't love this one. Yeah, he he collabed with an artist named Verdi, who's the artistic director for the Korean pop idol group Blackpink. Um, and he, basically this guy specializes in, you know, anime style and they turned Yuki's signature autumn leaves, which you can see on his traditional helmet. Well, like autumn leaves, maple leaves, autumn leaves, um, and turned it into an anime character. It just... It didn't hit. I get us. it. I get the intention behind it, the significance, but I don't I don't love it. That's just my personal thing. Yeah, pretty much. But Lando's I'm obsessed with. So he has yeah. like a huge monster energy helmet. 
Um, I love his normal monster energy one. This one's super cool. There's pink everywhere. There's a big monster logo. Um, it's pretty cool. It's very yeah. like exciting. I I really like what they did to, you know, kind of monsterfy Lando's own, you know, personal driver logo, the LN. Um, I and I I think that like they did a really good job of, you know taking it up a notch i think it's a really cool helmet and so he's two for two this year on awesome helmets you can tell like the people who design the helmets don't have anything to do with the liveries also that yes because <laughs> like that monster one that he normally has with all the squiggles and stuff how cool would that be on a livery that would be so cool on a livery, right like take take a page out of the f1 academy's books and do some cool ass liveries like i understand the sponsorship's mean more but do something exciting please at least for one race yeah That's all I'm asking yeah. for. we're just but. really stuck on how i'm not impressed we are with the mclaren livery clearly um yeah but yeah so i hopefully maybe we'll have a couple more specialty helmets as we go through the weekend if we do we will talk about them in the race recap um, i'm sure but- that lewis will have one i feel like lewis usually has one for this race yeah mm-hmm. he might we'll see i saw him yeah. wearing a you know um mushroom outfit did you see that on his Instagram? i think that was from last year but yes yeah I, well it was just reposted um yeah, yeah, yeah but i just i want someone to do like a mario kart themed helmet with like rainbow road everywhere and it just be like super fun and colorful probably can't because of you know rights and stuff but it'd be cool yeah, that would that would be really cool. I'm also really interested in seeing the fashion um, that we're going to get out of them being in Japan. Um, I'm also like preemptively really ready for the fashions we're going to see out of Zhou Guan Yu in China, which I know we've been talking about like all season long so far. Um, but let's be but honest, he brings it every single week. Every week. Every yeah. week. But I think him in China racing, one is going to be just monumentally really cool. significant and really cool but also i know he's just gonna bring the fashion i'm so oh excited. yeah it's gonna so be great. excited so before we get to that and this is our last kind of bit of, of news of the week I, I i wanted us to have a little bit of a discussion because this has been you know coming out a lot lately is will one of our favorite former drivers recently former return to formula one and that is sebastian vettel who has apparently been in talks with Mercedes and a number of other teams about potentially coming back to the grid. Um, what do you think about it, Emily? Okay, there's two schools of thought here. Do we want him to return to the grid to watch him race again? Yes. I think he's great for the sport. I think he, you know, is an amazing driver and would do great things coming back to the grid. One school of thought. Second school of thought. There's already so many talented young drivers competing for seats who are proving themselves ollie bearman um liam lawson who've proved that they can do really really well for not a lot of money as rookies so do i think it's realistic that he is going to come back and take a seat next year no i just don't think that because if you think about it he's you know world champion lots of experience He's not, I mean, maybe he would do it for a million, but there's probably not. He made more in his last year racing, so he's going to cost a lot more. And he's been out of the sport for a few seasons at that point. You don't really know what he truly can do. He is older. Um, There's just a lot of question marks around it still, I think. And I don't think you would get your, you know, benefit of how much he'll cost, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I I do think there are a couple of teams on the grid that would be willing to um to pay to to pay the actual money that that he would require. Um I think that it was unfortunate that he was at Aston Martin for 2 years when Aston Martin wasn't very competitive compared to where they are now. Yep. Um but the other thing is, you know, he's ever since he he retired, he he has talked about how much, you know, he's missed Formula 1, missed being on the grid, but at the same time, he also 
doesn't fail to mention that when he's racing and when he's traveling, he's also away from his family. I mean, he's got a young family that does not take part of, of the circus. They, they are very rarely in the paddock. They are very rarely captured on camera. Um, and his family is very important to him. So my thing, my thoughts here on this is that Sebastian Vettel will make some sort of return to Formula One, but it won't be as a driver. I agree with that. And he also does other racing, like him and uh, Schumacher uh, did a race together. I can't remember which one off the top of my head, but he's still like involved in motorsport and he's still doing things. And I definitely like, I still think he's a great ambassador for the sport. Like look right. at Suzuka last year with the, his whole B thing. I think that's, I love you know, the beach, the, the beehive know. thing. That was so like, he, so what, basically what he did is he brought all that. He invited the drivers to build these little beehives by behind turn two um, on the Suzuka track. And so all the drivers came out and they decorated them. It was really great. And like, so he, he is such an ambassador. He's really into environmentalism. It's very important to him. Um, and I, so I, I do think we can see him back in some sort of way that, you know, he won't, but he won't be in the car. No. And honestly, I think this is, I mean, way off track and hot take, but I think him as not extremely old, but an older driver who retired, being sticking around being an ambassador doing great things for the sport I think he's paving the way for Lewis Hamilton to find a position of doing the same because we've talked about this several times how when Lewis retires he you know should stick around we'd like to see him stick stick around because he's so great for the sport such a great advocate such a great advocate for the F1 academy he's really you know championing the the drive for diversity and everything and he's great for the sport he may not be our favorite driver but he is great for f1 and so i think sebastian kind of sticking around and showing lewis like you can leave but stay i think that's kind of you know he'll look to sub to to see his next move yeah i also just really quickly looked up how old sebastian vettel is because i did, did like i knew he's older than me and an older driver but i didn't exactly know he's 36 so he's not that old he's not like fernando alonso why do i feel like he's 45 right? years old right oh my gosh Sebastian I'm sorry I take it back you're not old because 36 is not even that older that much older than me right like I'm turning 34 in a month and so he's only two years older than I am so and I, I oh didn't my god realize, I thought he was like 45 I mean I I honestly thought he was closer to Fernando's age than my age um I think that we're having the same kind of crisis that I had when Don't I realized you bring that. Fernando's age um, into this <laughs> But we always do. I, I think this is like the same crisis when I realized that Kevin Magnuson is three years younger than I am because that threw me for a loop when I figured that out. Um, but that said, there are, you know, most of the drivers on the grid are not in their mid 30s right now. It's, no. you know, it's Lewis, it's Danny, it's um, Valtteri Botas, Sergio Perez, um, Hulkenberg and K Mags. And I, he, well, he's not in his 30s, but yes, <laughs> older. Um, but but yeah, it I think that it would it would take a lot for Sebastian Vettel to come back on the grid yeah. for a full year of driving that I don't think that he would want to invest in that. And I think he knows that too. Well, I think too, I mean, we've talked about this. Teams are gonna explore every option, right? So obviously they're gonna give that call to Seb, be like, hey, still don't want to do it, cool check him off the list right and so I think maybe it's it's more so where Sebastian Vettel's head is at versus teams like teams can yeah. consider anybody but are they considering racing so I think that's so do I think that teams are reaching out to him is that realistic probably but I don't think yeah. him returning is exactly I think I think that's the that's the crux of it like is he a viable option Absolutely. Is he more interested in say than than say like Kimi Raikkonen, who we would all love to see back on the grid, just oh because God. Kimi Raikkonen is an agent of chaos and hilarious on the radio? Um, but yeah, I, I I just don't actually see it happening. Nope. Me neither. Yeah. One of these days, we're gonna have to have a hot take discussion that we don't actually agree on. We'll get there, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that just about covers everything that happened in the news. I think that covers it. Now, do we actually move into the the Japanese Grand Prix? You know, yeah. what, 25 minutes into our, our discussions? 
35, but yes. Um, oh. So last year, which we do have episodes of, so you can you can see our race recap for um, Suzuka 2023. But of course, it was significantly less of a shit show than the 2022 race. Um, and also featured, as I said earlier, Sergio Perez's iconic double DNF um, and a bunch of other DNFs. But, you know, it was it was the Max and McLaren show. Um, we had yeah. Max with the win. Lando was P2. Oscar was P3. Max had pole and fastest lap. Um, and I think that the exciting parts of Japan were, A, it was Max's comeback after Singapore, um, and B, the double podium for McLaren. Yeah. Oh, Max. Anyways, it is what it is. And so, yeah, if you're thinking how do Emily and Catherine have an episode of Suzuka um, when we're in April and we didn't start until the summer, um, you you are correct in thinking that's weird. Again, the schedule has changed. The race is now in April. Um, I feel like we were just in Suzuka. I feel like we just had the double we DNF. Were. Um, but yeah, so here we are. And normally it's poor weather in Suzuka because of the time of year. And um, surprisingly, we are, you know, projected to also have bad weather for Suzuka this year, even though it's changed. Um, so there is rain in the forecast for Sunday, which could make it interesting. Yeah, I think it, it's definitely an, an opportunity for us to have a little bit more chaos and considering the chaos we've had for the last couple of races, obviously Max's DNF last week and then Ollie Behrman's appearance uh, two races ago in Saudi Arabia. I don't mind a, a little bit of rain to see what kind of no. chaos that could bring to to the race. And it's only the race. So, I mean, we'll, we'll have, I think, what we expect to see out of the free practices and out of qualifying unless the weather rapidly changes between now and this weekend, which it could. Um, but I, I think hate that when that happens, though, like when it's clear and then it rains on race day because like the, the having to get the car setups and everything, getting the tire um, selections right through all of those days and everything, it just throws everything so like you said it, it's just mass chaos so yeah, yeah I think it, it, it can be interesting favorite. I think it's it's also you know part of the the challenge for you know teams is you know you're you're getting yourself set up what does it mean to get yourself set up when you also have to have a you know weather contingency for Sunday when everything else is fine so I think it's another layer to the the challenges that the you know drivers and strategy teams face Oh, Ferrari doesn't need any more challenges. Well, that is always correct. I mean, I know Carlos won last week or last race, but I don't think that was because Ferrari strategy helping him. No, I think if anything, he made the they decisions just, to overrule the Ferrari strategy. They just they, struggle they also, and I don't understand it. I don't understand how you can struggle this badly with strategy. Well, they also didn't have a leg to stand on to try to undermine him in favor of Charles, which we do see at other, you know, races because he was in the lead. They're not going to say you need to give up the lead for Charles in race Honestly, three. I'm surprised they didn't. I but. think the only reason why they did it was because it was race three and not race 20. Um, obviously, we've seen in the past with Mercedes when Valtteri Botas was driving with Lewis Hamilton, yeah. there, there were times where Valtteri would be in the lead and they would you know, James Vowles would come on the radio and say, Valtteri, it's James. We need you to move James, aside it's from Valtteri. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> so good. No, 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 no. I know. I just, I, I'm just voicing as a Ferrari fan. We're going to probably struggle this weekend. So. Dang. Yeah. Sorry. Go team. It's okay. Yeah. Um, and before we get into predictions, the other thing that we're going to be seeing this weekend that we're seeing very early this, this year is mm -hmm. our first young driver, um, practice session appearance, um, which I, I think was done on purpose, yes. um, for two, for two reasons. Um, so we're seeing, um, Red Bull, um, junior driver, Ayuma Uwasa, um, will be driving in place of Danny Ricardo in FP1 in the RB, um, and Two reasons why they did it. Number one is they knocked it out early because he's a Japanese driver. This is Japan. J Japanese fans love Japanese drivers. Why not give a one practice session with two Japanese drivers on the grid together? That's and honestly, it's really cool. 
I, I think it's great. And then the other reasoning is, you know, because usually they wait until like, you know, Mexico, Abu Dhabi, Brazil to knock these out is I think that this gives Daniel Ricardo more time in the car down the stretch when hopefully he is, you know, handling the car a little bit better and driving a little bit better um, that he can sacrifice an hour out of the car in April and it will matter less to, you know, what's happening with him in the car than it would be in October. A hundred percent agree. Look at us just agreeing left and right today. <laughs> what, what is, is this? this? Hell has frozen over. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, um, part of the reason why we're such good friends is because we have the same opinions on this sport. <laughs> Unless it comes to Red Bull and then we don't. But that is correct. Yes. Indeed. All right. Shall we get into our predictions? Let's get into it. All right. For poll, who you got? Um, I'm going with, I, this, this is probably not the greatest pick but i'm gonna stick with max this week i know i really struggled with this one too i put max um i don't love the pick but with just the uncertainty of weather and everything um i feel like ferrari is gonna mess something up in qualifying with their tires so i am going max my my thought with it was I did think about either um, Ferrari driver instead of Max, but I think that because Max DNF last week, we're going to have the Max Verstappen Revenge Tour, um, which that. is something he does well in Suzuka. So yeah. that's ultimately why I decided to to stick with Max for the fourth race in a row um, is because of that. No, that's fair. I, you know, I don't know Max personally. Um, but when people get mad, sometimes they get even more mad and then things blow up and they don't go well and you don't have a revenge tour. Um, so I personally feel like Max will either do really, really well or do really, really poorly because he's like trying so hard to compensate for him last week because he's still- I, I don't think that he feels the need to, to, you know, over, overcompensate because of what happened. I think that, you know, they, they came off of the DNF very like, we hate that it happened, but we know what the issue is. Um, yeah. So, do I think that I will be picking Ferrari drivers for pole at some point this season? Yes. Just not now. Fair. Fair, fair. All right. Yeah. Who's your podium? And for those of you guys keeping track, Catherine did get a full podium one of these races. I still have not yet picked one, um, mostly because I refuse to give Red Bull all of the acknowledgement that they probably deserve, which is fine. Um, but if you pick podium we each get five points but you have to have the whole thing correct not just people on the podium so Catherine that's correct who is your podium so I picked a Max Verstappen win with a Carlos Sainz P2 and a Lando Norris P3 you've got to be kidding me I did the what? same thing what? I did the exact same thing I'm oh like, my you gosh can, you can see it Maybe. <laughs> you probably can't. Amazing. I can't. But I see literally it. I can't. have the same exact thing. <laughs> God damn it. Why are we on such a same page? And so for those of you who don't know and, and miss it the last couple of episodes, usually we will both write our prediction, our, our podium predictions, all of our predictions in on the rundown. But this year we have decided to do secret ballot. Um, so we keep them in our notes apps instead and our notes apps are not shared. Um, so um, it is a surprise. And yeah, this. Well, at least if I lose, you lose. That's all, that that's all I can say for this. Okay, um, so for P10. Oh, I totally... P10. <laughs> I saw that, that's fine. Um, so for P10, <laughs> we pick P10 because it's the last position where you earn points. You get one point for P10. Historically, it's been very challenging for us to pick this because P10 is a really hard spot to figure out. Lots of fighting and changing throughout the race. So P10, Catherine, who do you have? Um, I picked this um, on Vibes, um, which is how I picked my podium poll P10 sweep from Saudi Arabia. I don't know if this is going to be a repeat, um, but I picked Lance Stroll. No, I did too! What? <laughs> As you're talking, I'm like, no, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. God dang it, Catherine. <laughs> oh. Okay. So I was like, 
I put a lot of thought into this. I'm like, okay, this is going to be really, really, but maybe this is good vibes because if we're both feeling this, then it's like, we're putting it out into the universe and it's actually going to happen. And, and maybe this, this will help you pick up some more points so that you're not trailing 11 to two anymore. No, I'll just be trailing the same amount because we'll get the same amount of points. That's yeah, how this that's works. True. Math, Catherine. But you math. will have you will have more than two points. I'm bad at math. We know this. All right. Okay, so Emily, who is your biggest surprise for this weekend? Hopefully we wouldn't have the same ones for that. I don't think we will. Um, so I said Merck is gonna come out and have a and just Mercedes in general. Um they double DNF last race. I think they're gonna come back. Probably both be in the points. I think they're just going to have a good showing. Um, however, I feel like that is a surprise because they've not been doing well. Yeah. Um, but I think they're going to, you know, I and I think it's going to start in qualifying. I think they're going to have a really strong showing in qualifying and then both be in the points. So. Yeah, I... I th- I think that they for for their state of mind and for for Lewis's sanity I think they need that and oh, yeah. you know I I've, I've said many times that that Mercedes is really good at like sneakily grabbing up a lot of points which is how they stay so high up in the drivers and constructors standings while not being yeah. necessarily for the driver side being in the top 5 but they still are you know sneakily have these strong performances that do sometimes get overlooked um so it's it's entirely possible mine i think is going to be a little bit more of a stretch um and i want to see happen i don't know if it would happen but my biggest surprise is that Danny's gonna finally have a good weekend yeah uh, i don't know what's going on he's he's looking like danny of old of the mclaren days of the mclaren days um I haven't seen him really look like Mexico Danny since Mexico. this season yet since Mexico. Yeah. And I know he's, you know, struggled and, and he's kind of up and down, but I hope he just doesn't get down too much. And maybe he'll have a really good weekend. Um, I don't know. But yeah, I think that would be a surprise. I, I mean, we would all love for him to be, te- you know, not even P10, but P7, P8, really get points, be the Danny of old. But I don't know. I just don't know if he has it in him. Which makes me a little nervous for a seat next year, but yeah, it'll it'll be it'll be interesting, and I think that a lot of people are saying like, why are we so focused on Daniel staying in a seat? Not like we, as in you and me specifically, but you know, Daniel fans, yeah. when there are so many other good options out there, Ollie Behrman and Liam Lawson, to name a couple. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm. It has to be a correct prediction sometime. Like Dan, Danny's not going to have a terrible weekend every weekend. We hope. Um, it would be really awful if he did just for everything yeah. that it took to get him back in the car. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm not banking we'll on this one, but we'll see. <sighs> we'll see. Uh, all right. And then that brings us to who's going to do a dumb this weekend, Catherine. I'm really worried about Williams. Yeah. I toiled between Williams and what I actually picked, but, um, yeah, without having another like just seeing what happened in Australia makes me not super comfy and warm and fuzzy yeah. about Williams. And I at the end of last season, we when we did our, you know, outlook or whatever, I said that Williams was going to have a really strong season because mm-hmm. um, they looked really good last year just, you know, developing more um but I don't know, I just I'm not seeing it. So yeah, I mean, that That said, Williams is a team that in the last few years has historically developed better down the stretch right. like, as exactly. the season goes on. So, you know, and obviously we've seen the stunning turnaround from McLaren last season. So yeah, is Williams fair. completely down for the count? No. C- compared to the other two teams that are struggling? Definitely not. Right. Um, that said... I'm really worried about Williams for this stretch and until they can get that third chassis. Right. I completely agree with everything that you just said. All right. Who's your going to do with them? Sauber. I mean, I just, I can't with them. Yeah. It's it's those wheel nuts. The mean green lime or the mean, lean, mean lime green machine. I don't remember how I said it that one time. I I think that was right. um, Yeah. I mean, until they get those pit stops, under control I just I don't know and I feel like we're gonna have you know a minute long pit stop again that or what's gonna happen is they're gonna try and come in and if it's raining they'll go from wets to slicks or slicks to wet 
trying to you know keep up and it's just going to ruin their race that's yeah i i think if if there's a team that is most at risk for having an issue when it comes to weather it's going to be sauber and not at fault of the drivers but just because like until they can fix this issue with the wheel nuts which i don't think will happen until after we leave china um and they get back to mainland europe i i just think that the cars it is just screwed at this point but you'd think that they would be doing something to bring, because I know it's been like rumored that teams are bringing upgrades already and it's only the fourth race. Oh, um, which Red Bull is one of those teams. Right. Yeah. But I don't understand how like you can just continue being so bad and taking minute long pit stops with this. And maybe it's a it's a huge engineering nightmare and they really can't fix it and figure it out. But it seems like it shouldn't be. Again, not I yeah, have zero engineering experience, but it just seems I I think that because it's a part of the car and you know where it is in oh, relation with the tires and the suspension, I, I, I think it, I that's it. where the problem is. Um but But you have fact- to take a look at it and be like, okay, this is gonna continue to happen, us coming in dead last with this issue you would think they'd switch their priority to fixing that. And maybe they are, and it's just taking a long time, but it just seems odd for them, like, not to come out and say, hey, we're fixing this after three right. races where it's been an issue. Yeah, I, I I really think that the biggest issue with this is that they're so far from their factories. And, like, t- that's the, yeah, the, that's the fact that you have to, you know, fly any new parts and pieces all the way around the world, you know, because of where they are right now, you know, Sauber is based in Switzerland and they're yeah. in Tokyo or near Tokyo. Um, I think that that's where the continued issues are and that I, I really don't think we're going to see anything better from them from a pit stop standpoint um, until whatever race is after, uh, after China. That's fair. All right. That's fair. All right. Final thoughts for Japan. I'm really excited. I just love Suzuka so much. Like this I is know. one of the This most... is like your favorite or it one is, of your favorites. It is it is absolutely one of my favorites. It's such a great track. It's such a great environment. The 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 fans in Japan really Are make insane. this one of the coolest races to be at and um I just I mean, it's it's a bucket list race for me, absolutely, and I'm oh, really excited sure. to see what we're we're gonna get this weekend. Obviously, as a Red Bull fan, I'm I'm you know expecting to see a, a major Max Verstappen come back, um, but yeah, it'll be. I think this is gonna be a really good race, especially with how Carlos is doing in his post appendix life. Um, two things. You didn't make this comment, but I will make it just to make it a point. How proud of me are you that I did not choose Checo of who's going to be a dumb? <laughs> I am so proud really proud, of you. right? I know. Yeah. I was like, hmm, no, that's too predictable. Um, I, I don't think he's going to double DNF again in the same hey, race. Never say never, Catherine. Um, anyways, uh, and two, I'm so excited for Suzuka. I too love it. Um, I'm excited for the fashion that they bring mm-hmm. because for some reason this race has turned into like you know Paris Fashion Week and everything right? is amazing. Um, but that's just something that I'm really excited about. But I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm very excited to see what happens to see Carlos post victory. So we'll see. Yeah, it's gonna be I good also I've got good going going it. back to to the fans and and the fashion and that intersection. I also am really excited to see like these fans build like full on you know Hats. costumes and like cars out of cardboard and plastic, and like the engineering feats on these things alone are just fascinating. So I'm really, really excited cool. to see the the cool pictures of like the fan gear and all of that that we're gonna get out of this. All of like the car hats and everything from last year were just like so so cool to see. The so. the DRS wings and all yep. of that. Yeah. Yep. No, I'm super excited. Oh, all right. Well, make sure that you stay tuned with us all weekend. We'll be covering all the free practices and the and qualifying and the race, obviously. But before we leave, Catherine, what is our F1 fun fact of the day? So our F1 fun fact for this episode is actually about my not most favorite driver of all time, but I thought that this was really interesting, is Lewis Hamilton has raced against three different members of the same family in his Formula One career. Schumacher. Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> so, and, and the other really interesting part is he has never raced against more than one Schumacher at a time. So his rookie season in 2007, Ralph Schumacher was still on the grid. And then Mick Schumacher, or no, Michael Schumacher Sr., um, he came on, um, he returned to the grid from 2010 to 2012. And then we had Mick Schumacher in 2021 to 22. I'm proud of myself for knowing that one but I feel like it's kind of a, an easy one just considering the time but mm -hmm. I also love how we've now moved from aging Fernando Alonso to aging Lewis Hamilton <laughs> that that is true I mean Lewis has been on the grid since 2007 it's been a minute um but I just thought that it was you know fascinating like you know, to have a, the dynasty that the Schumacher family has yeah. um, with all the success that Michael had, um, you know, Ralph was also on the grid. Um, and then Mick had two seasons in a really, really bad Haas car. Um, but that is still a large number of people with the same last name to be racing within the same, what, two decades? Yeah. No, it is. That's, that's not necessarily like a common thing that happens. It's, it's not, especially when you think like in the grand scheme of Formula One, I don't know off the, I don't remember off the top of my head, how many drivers we've had on the grid, you know, period, but it's not that many people get to wear a Formula One, you know, race suit and get to, you know, drive a Formula One race. So the fact that you've got three guys with the same last name and Lewis drove against all three of them is pretty cool. Yeah. No, I like that fun fact. That's Thanks. a good one. You are welcome. Well, coming up next for the podcast, we will have our Japanese Grand Prix recap out on Monday. That's it. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>